My name is Liza Bernard on behalf of the Norman Williams Public Library. I welcome you to our snapshot events, Link by Link, a Vermont Women's Bold Acts for Peace and Civil Rights with Pamela Nicole Walker. Snapshot is a Vermont Humanities weekly live stream program that hosts a variety of speakers at public libraries each year on the scene. We extend our thanks to our partners in Vermont Humanities, as well as to generous underwriters who make it possible for us to offer such rich and robust programming. The sponsor of our entire network, uh, snap, the sponsor of our entire snapshot season is the Vermont Department of Libraries, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and the Alma Gibbs Donche Foundation. Today we come together from across the state to listen, to learn, to be inspired in community. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. So Pamela Nicole Walker is an assistant professor of African American history at the University of Vermont. She received her doctorate in African American and women's history from Rutgers University in New Brunswick. And she's currently working on a book titled, Science Seal Delivered, How Black and White Mothers Use the Box Project and the Postal System to Fight Hunger and Feed the Mississippi Freedom Movement. Science Seal Delivered tells a new and illuminating story of ordinary black and white women, women's overlooked participation in the modern civil rights movement using one of the nation's largest federal agencies, the U.S. Postal Service. Without further ado, thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you all for being here. It's an honor to be a part of the Vermont Humanities Lecture Series, to be um, speaking here at the library. I want to thank Jacob for organizing. I want to thank everyone here at Norman Williams for hosting me. Um, I am so delighted to be here. So you all um, are getting a snippet of the book that I am currently writing called Signs Still Delivered, How Black and White Women Use the Box Project and the postal system to fight hunger and feed the Mississippi freedom movement. And this looks at civil rights, it looks at pacifism, it looks at benevolence, um, and examines the ways that these movements were connected by the diligent work of women writing letters, sending goods, developing friendships, most of them without ever meeting, with this goal of creating enduring peace and justice through relationships. I look at this through an organization called The Box Project. It was an anti-poverty program that was started at the height of the civil rights movement to alleviate Southern poverty and grant Northerners the opportunity to participate in civil rights. So after the talk, I invite ideas, feedback, um, especially for the Vermont aspect of this project. If you know of people I can talk to or archives I should visit or even back to the land connections, I, I welcome all of that. I am going to be talking to you all um, about the founder of this project. This project has kind of multiple locations. So Vermont is a key location. Mississippi is a location, key location. But for today, I'm going to be talking about the founder of the project, Virginia Nave, who homesteaded here in Vermont for nearly 20 years. And I'm going to start this story in perhaps an unlikely place, her funeral. Is it finished there? All right, so on January 21st, 2018, people from all over the valley made their way to a small, single-room community center in Creston, British Columbia, Canada, where Virginia Nave's memorial was held nearly a year after her death. Inside, about 50 folding chairs faced a simple projector, and a modest conductor stand stood in lieu of a podium. Nave's relatives had placed one of her oil paintings, a captivatingly busy and colorful piece, in the front of the room. Over the course of about two hours or so, peace movement comrades, health food store owners, artists, collaborators, and old-time friends and family, long-time friends and family, gathered to pay their respects with funny stories and poetry and song to the ever-curious adamantly pacifist, organic farming, compassionate but never coddling, cartwheeling great-grandma. According to admirers, she was no shrinking violet. Rather, she was 
a loud and fierce woman who simply did things without asking. As the program went on, and as each person carefully recounted the sliver of life that Virginia Nave had granted them access to, a common refrain emerged. Folks would come up to the podium and say, I, I thought I knew Virginia. Virginia's accomplishments as an artist were well known, but her history of protest and activism belonged, that history belonged to her husband, Lowell who had served over four and a half years in prison as a conscientious, conscientious objector to World War II. They would say, we heard about Lowell's World War II experiences and how he and Virginia had moved to Canada. Protest thinking was all around us, but I had never heard of Virginia's part of it. I had never heard of the Vox Project. And so Virginia Picasso Nave was born in South Dakota in the 1920s and she was a child of the Great Depression. She had a transient life, um, transient early life. She moved from South Dakota to Oklahoma to New Mexico as her father sought employment before the family settled in California where she finished high school. By the war and shortly after, however, Nave was a professional artist living in Bohemian Greenwich Village with her partner Lowell Nave, a World War II conscientious objector and a woodblock printer who had spent time in prison, and he had spent time in Vermont with the Nearings. This is how they ended up in Vermont in the late 1940s. Fleeing the city and industrial capitalism in favor of bucolic peace, they came. Um, they became successful artists and teachers and homesteaders in Jamaica, Vermont through the 1950s and early 60s. They chose the good life, building their home from stones, solitude in their studios and on their farm. Uh, this was a life of rurality and it was also a life of racial isolation, both of which would have an impact on Nave's peace and civil rights work. Rural isolation created a unique opportunity for Nave and the peace movement. She almost missed the first march she attended because she didn't have a car. And she was miles away from the Hanover hub of activist women planning to go to the 1961 Women's Strike for Peace March in Washington, DC. After calling around, not only did she find transportation for herself, but she corralled 11 more women from the area, three carloads full from Vermont and New Hampshire to go to the march. On November 1st, 1961, they joined an estimated 50,000 women and mothers who stepped away from their domestic duties and jobs for a nationwide peace strike. Women's Strike for Peace was an organization turned movement that fought for an international nuclear uh, test ban. And Nave took to Women's Strike for Peace immediately. After the march, she formed a peace group in Woodstock, Vermont. And unlike many Women's Strike for Peace leaders, she was not metropolitan and she was not wealthy. In fact, Virginia's bohemian roots, her rurality, her working class sensibilities, those placed her outside of the traditional representations of the middle class, suburban, or urban Women's Strike for Peace participants, many of whom came from elite backgrounds or had well-established professional husbands. Upon learning about a January 1962 Women's Strike for Peace march, another Women's Strike for Peace march in the nation's capital, Virginia, without hesitation, volunteered herself at a local peace meeting uh, the December prior. She said, as this demonstration seemed like a good thing to be represented at, I got up and announced I was going and asked if anyone else would go. One woman could, her husband was a photographer, and I asked if he could go too. And so with our own photographer, we made the trip. Her rural folksy background and her get up and go attitude was what eventually garnered her this invitation, if token, to an international peace demonstration to Geneva, Switzerland in 1962. It was an offer that she couldn't refuse if she could find the money to go. She had exactly, according to her, $6 to her name. But somehow, using her typewriter and her pen, Nave skillfully raised the $362.75 necessary for the airfare and lodging in Geneva in just nine days. Virginia would later critique Women's Strike for Peace for their classism and metrocentrism, which made it difficult, to, which made it difficult for less 
wealthy and more rural women to participate in these international conferences. Nevertheless, the whirlwind journey, which included a stopover in London, which opened, um, opened myriad doors for Virginia's pacifist work. Women Strike for Peace's goal was to demonstrate to statesmen of all nations the growing concern of women around the world for the future of the human race. The voyage created an opportunity for Virginia to extend her peace connections outside of the Northeast, around the globe, and also to two Southern civil rights activists, Claire Collins Harvey of Jackson, Mississippi, and Coretta Scott King of Atlanta, Georgia, the only two black women on the, on the trip. Over the course of the trip, the three women engaged in numerous discussions about civil rights and peace movements, eventually becoming united in the belief that war and segregation were a part of the same fabric of man's inhumanity against man. These women, Claire Harvey in particular, who's pictured here, um, would open the door for Virginia's later involvement in the Southern Civil Rights Movement. This genuine consideration of African American civil rights had been absent, at least in Virginia's writing, in her uh, kind of progressive political framework until she, she joined with these uh, women. In her writing, Nave discussed coming from a rural area that she described as a, quote, strictly white area, quote, with the nearest, quote, Negro living 17 miles away. Nave had few opportunities with, to interact with people who do not look like her. And so the unlikely consequence of Virginia's international peace activism is that it took this globe-trotting pacifist work for her to meet two black American women who would awaken her to the brutalities of Southern racism in her own country. When she got back from Geneva, Virginia wrote letters to King and Harvey requesting the name of a black family that she might send food and clothing to. And she asked for more contacts in the Southern Civil Rights Movement. While waiting to hear back, she sent multicultural children's books and sewing materials for Easter dresses to Meridian, Mississippi, a freedom school and library there. King and Harvey followed up with contacts, sending information of families in need in both Georgia and Mississippi. And while Coretta Scott King and Claire Harvey are both um, credited for Virginia Nave's enlightenment of the Southern Freedom Movement, it's really Harvey's friendship, um, their long-standing friendship that bridged Nave's activism from north to south and south to north. By the time they met, Hay Harvey was an established activist and a respected member of the black middle class. She was a world citizen. Harvey was an experienced international, uh, um, experienced in international ecumenical organizing through the Methodist Church and the World Conference of Christian Youth and the YWCA and Church Women United. Harvey had been educated in the halls of the top historically black colleges and universities and in the Ivy League, she went to Columbia for graduate school. Her credentials rivaled even the most elite women um, and respected women in the majority white organization of Women's Strike for Peace. With a husband who seemed only to respect her drive and independence, Harvey ran her family's business, Collins Funeral Home in Jackson, Mississippi, and the heart of the black business district, just steps away from the NAACP office of state field uh, field state, state secretary and activist, colleague Megger Evers, and it was uh, Collins Funeral Home that would perform the services um, for Megger Evers after his assassination in 1963. And so Harvey and Nave sparked a deep connection during their multiple international trips together. Soon they were exchanging quickly pecked uh, letters and handwritten notes, both about the peace movement and the civil rights movements. They were opposites in many ways. Nave was agnostic. Harvey was his leader in the Methodist Church. Harvey was educated at some of the best universities in the country, while Nave left school, left college to go to art school. Harvey was a rooted, lifelong resident in Mississippi, while Nave was a bit of a wandering artist before homesteading in Vermont. The economic juxtaposition of these women is unique as well. Nave considered herself poor for, quote, white standards, on at, and on at least one occasion reached out to Harvey for financial help to go on an international peace trip. 
these distinctions could make them foils, but they really serve to be these kind of complementary puzzle pieces together in this movement. They became deep and dear friends. Nave yearned for up-to-the-minute news about the civil rights movement, and Collins was her, her main line. Nave once implored Collins to quote, write when you have time, otherwise we only get stuff out of the newspapers and you know them. To Nave, northern newspapers allied at the truth just as much as southern ones. In, June, in a June 1964 letter, Nave discussed the disappearance of James Cheney, Andrew Goodwin, Goodman, and Michael Schwerner, whose wife Rita was well acquainted with Nave. Nave had only heard about the missing activist because of a phone call, as most of the local coverage, especially on the radio, was, quote, lousy. Nave urged Collins to send any newspapers on, quote, all of this and share any, quote, propaganda that could be circulated among friends. Nave closed with a plea for her friend's safety. She said, Claire, take care. No lousy bullet is worth one of you working for integration. We will do all we can. Harvey and her husband purchased a subscription um, to the Freedom Press. This was a black newspaper that had been founded by Megar Evers, and they sent it to the Knaves. The paper gave Knave up to the minute, uh, an up-to-the-minute account of poverty and injustice occurring in Mississippi, and it provided the names and addi of additional families that needed help. In April of 1964, Harvey again explained um, again expanded Nave's network by including her and sending her contact information for 33 Mississippi win women who were involved in Harvey's organization called Women's Power Unlimited. And Harvey's organization, Women Power Unlimited, did a lot of work for the civil rights movement. They fed civil rights activists who came to the state, um, they clothed them, they raised uh, bail money for students who had been arrested for participating in freedom rides and lunch counter sit-ins. And so Harvey was extremely well connected in the movement. Harvey connects um, Virginia Nave to a woman named Rosie Redmond Holden, and she was the chairwoman of the Closed Committee of Women Power Unlimited. This was an integral connection for Nave, as she sought to establish relationships with Mississippians who were already doing the work of food and clothing distribution. These women were key on-the-ground collaborators for Virginia Nave. They provided information, contacts, and resources that helped expand access to other Mississippi families who might need food and clothing. Nave, along with her peace comrades, Myrtle Lane, who was living in uh, Montpelier at the time, and Mary Knight, who was an expat living just over the Canadian border, these three women, Nave, Knight, and Lane, served the northern wing of the Box Project. After another international peace trip that spring, Nave went to work on a civil rights fair, scheduled for July 18, 1964. One of the objectives to this fair um, was to bring the urgency of the civil rights movement to Vermont. Nave was intent on deprogramming what she considered to be the ignorance and apathy of New Englanders, especially among elite women, um, about the movement as much as she desired to provide material support. So this, this civil rights fair was twofold. It was to educate people and it was to get resources for Mississippi. Nearly every letter that Nave wrote to Harvey in the summer of 1964 requested leaflets, booklets, whatever we can display at the fair about Mississippi. She said, people have got to know what is going on down there. Offering a, a centralized location of her homestead to access information through pamphlets and films and firsthand accounts and letters, Nave established herself as a regional leader on the question of civil rights. The fair uh, came together within a year of two fatal attacks against African Americans that had garnered national attention. So the first was the murder of Mecker Evers. He was assassinated in June of 1963. And the second was a 16th Street church bombing in Birmingham, which killed four little girls um, on their way to Sunday school, which happened in September of 1963. And so this fair also coincided with the Mass and Freedom Summer campaign and the midsummer disappearance of the three Freedom Summer workers that I mentioned earlier, who wouldn't be found until a month after the fair. So given the spate of violent attacks in the South and the momentum of Freedom Summer, 
Virginia had no trouble garnering uh, local interest in the Civil Rights Fair. Um, she had no trouble enlisting volunteers. The Civil Rights Fair promised art and film screenings and good company and an auction. And if it were a, warm, were a warm day, a dip in the stony swimming hole along the same brook that the knaves had harvested stones to build their home. The fair would raise money for individuals and organizations and the civil rights movement and would help pay the college tuition of black students. Monies would also support a farming cooperative, a community center for a freedom school, a sandal making cooperative. She said the main objective, however, was to quote, help the project people to help themselves, to achieve self-respect and pride in the future work that they do. Marketed as a family-friendly event, the flyer promoted folk singing by a local uh, artist and professional, a personal friend of Nave's. And she said, cash admission was not required. But Virginia asked that, quote, each and every one of you bring as admission non-perishable food item or clothing, shoes or books, records, or office supplies to be sent south. Virginia's flyer stressed the importance of strong attendance and that the audience use their purchasing power to make an impact, writing, the more people, the more sales, the more money we'll make for the freedom cause. And this was, this was Virginia's version of peace, our vision of peace, a united interracial human family that always answered the call to quote, help our brother. The fair quenched the thirst of those who were aware of devastation in the South and desire to mitigate suffering while enlightening others who might have been indifferent. Um, it utilized expansive local networks and these networks made the fair possible through donations of quality goods, posters, donations of boutique style children's clothes, screen printed t-shirts, placemats, coasters, homemade cookies. One friend promised 30 jars of, uh, jars of jam and 10 or so loaves of bread and quote, all the unsold furniture we can fit in our truck for sale. Local artisans gifted fine woodwork pieces of pottery and jewelry for auction. Utilizing her own artistic skills, Virginia made a few small mosaics to sell as well as homemade ice cream and fudge. For folk singing and speaking, some friends brought over speakers and amplifiers. It was a collective project and that people contributed in ways that they could. Women took hold of areas rooted in their own special skills, like cooking, organizing for the rummage sale, corralling others to come out. Even those who felt themselves limited um, volunteered the skill, skills of others. One woman who was, quote, somewhat handicapped in energy due to expected motherhood recommended, quote, a friend who is an excellent cook to donate prepared foods. Folk singers Pete and Tashi Seeger could not make it to Pikes Falls, but they sent a financial donation. June 18, 1964 was a hotter day than usual. Still hundreds of New Englanders in plaid shirts and khaki shorts and summer dresses made their way to the Nave estate. The stone dwellings and barns and intermittent green spaces were made festive with colorful banners and tents. Children in swim trunks and swimsuits ran bare barefoot after cooling off in the falls while toddlers donned onesies from the shoulders of their parents to get a better look at the auction. Emma Bailey, the day's auctioneer, held court under the multicolored parachute tent, waving wooden bowls and ceramics and mosaics and antiques to the highest bidders, stretched out in chairs and blankets across the lawn. Families perused tables of booklets and other printed materials on civil rights held in place with small stones from the lake. And book tables and clothing displays on while mothers examine boutique and secondhand clothing that their little ones might grow into. And so and attendees enjoyed picnics um, and enjoyed picnic, uh, brought lunches on, um, and enjoyed their lunches on stones near the brooks or in some of the grassy areas and enjoy, indulged in the fresh bread and homemade jam from the fair. By all accounts, the fair was a huge success and a critical step in the formalization of this box project that Nave was on the cusp of creating. Letters arrived soon after um, folks had gotten home, mere hours after attendees had left, thanking Virginia for a wonderful time and the splendid work. 
Families like Ellis and Lieberman's went home not only with goodies for themselves, but two loaves of, quote, good bread, a beautiful bowl, a nice green lampshade, a casserole, but also two packages that they will mail tomorrow. And these were packages that begin the kind of beginning pieces of the box project that these families would start to mail to Southern black families in Mississippi. A half page article in the Brattleboro Reformer reported that the fair was attended by quote, several hundred persons and raised $1,100 in addition to hundreds of donated items. By the time the article went to print, $808 had been sent out to 16 organizations in Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Vermont. Some of the recipients included the Council of Federated Organiz Organizations and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. These are two groups, key groups that are doing the work um, in Mississippi for voter registration. NAVE also sent $50 to Claire Collins Harvey's organization, Women Power Unlimited. Um, and this, her group was assisting in housing students and getting supplies for students for Freedom Summer. Notable too were um, Vermont projects that were benefiting from the Civil Rights Fair. So the Burlington NAACP and the Vermont and Mississippi Project, a biracial nonprofit that was making its way to Jackson, Mississippi um, and committed to racial inclusion through education and material support, they also received um, proceeds. Ted Seaver, who's pictured here, was the Vermont and Mississippi founder. He was a Montpelier teacher and he was a Freedom Summer volunteer. And he helped with hauling a trailer full of donated items to Mississippi that fall that had been collected from the Civil Rights Fair. The press of the event is part of the reason why Coretta Scott King gets a lot of the credit for helping found the organization and not Claire Collins Harvey. Um, and Nave is partly to blame for this. King. Coretta Scott King had been active in the peace movement, but she had a very small connection with the Box Project. Um, there's not much evidence that she provided more than just the name of one family. And it's really Claire Collins Harvey um, who allowed Virginia Nave and her Box Project to kind of graft on top of her organization in, Min in Mississippi. Um, she provided the postal um, information for families who needed help, other activist networks, and yet when the media reached out to Virginia Nave about the origins and her inspiration for the project and her inspiration for the Civil Rights Fair, she used Coretta Scott King's name and omitted Claire Harvey's name altogether. And a letter to Harvey discussing the article that covered the fair, Nave kind of attempted to apologize um, by kind of talking about why she had to use Coretta King's name she says, enclosed is a write-up that just came out since the fair. Some of it's not correct, but overall the coverage is good. I had to use Coretta King's name in your place as people do know who she is, but you were the motivation. The confession might have stung for Harvey and in some ways ensured the erasure of the Box Project, uh, of Harvey's connection to the Box Project, but it did kind of help get the word out by connecting it with uh, a kind of more notable figure within the movement. After the money was allocated, the work was not done. Nave had to, or had to organize her garage, which was filled floor to ceiling with donated food and clothing items. These clothes needed to be cleaned, organized, cataloged, and then allocated to the appropriate recipients based on size of family and family need. Most of the shoes that uh, had been collected at the Civil Rights Fair, according to Nave, were impractical. They were either too small or they were heels. She said they even received a pair of Christian Dior shoes. So Nave had to go on reconnaissance um, in town to collect suitable shoes from women um, and for women and families who walked most place, places in the rural South, including church and worked in agriculture. Um, Southern families needed uh, shoes for their children to go to school. And so she went looking and collecting shoes from, from rum and sales and things like that. And it took over six months to sort through everything. Um, and and uh, Nave was a skill for recru recruiters. She did not do this work on her own. She enlisted the, the help of a few faithful helpers. One woman drove 35 miles each way to help mend, wash, and fold the soiled clothes from the fair. Myrtle Lane was a crucial aide. She wrapped boxes, 
while Mary Knight gave stamps and provided money for postage. This troop of committed doers, organizers, and collectors, and runners of food and clothing led Virginia's husband Lowell to call the women the Mississippi Salvation Army. Corresponding with uh, Southern black families um, about the conditions in Mississippi revealed that food and clothing was a critical part of the civil rights movement. And this, this aspect of collecting food and clothing coalesced with Virginia Knave's ethics of care. Once enlightened on the matter of food and the, the, the dire need for food, um, as with the case for most, most things, Virginia decided to lead these efforts, first in New England, but gradually across the country for collecting food and clothing for Southern families. And she utilized her postal networks that she had from the peace movement, in addition to the postal networks that she got from Claire Collins Harvey. She also was committed to doing more than just offering food and clothing. She offered respite to those activists who were on the front lines. And so she, at one point, she invited Rita Schwerner up to Vermont when her husband, shortly after her husband's body had been found in August of 1964. She said she sent her last $50 um, that she had for a vacation to New York for Greenwood civil rights organizer, Sam Block, because, quote, a team of doctors um, who had come down said he had to get away from Mississippi or he was gonna collapse. Whatever she had, money for SNCC, um, transportation for civil rights workers, clothes for sharecroppers facing reprisals, children's books for a burned down Freedom Center, a neighbor's postage for boxes, um, her home for tired activists. Nave offered it up for this Freedom Project from the confines of her homestead in Vermont. The closing lines of a letter to her dear friend, Claire Harvey, really encapsulate the sentiment um, and this promise of solidarity. She said, we'll keep up the work up here. Please don't despair. You have many friends. So by mid-August, a month after the Civil Rights Fair, Nave had sent down 79 boxes. By December, um, her crew of women had wrapped, packed, and organized 250 boxes to send out. Interestingly, Virginia Knave's children sometimes question why their mothers was so committed and devoted to ameliorating Southern poverty when their clothes were often tattered too. Admittedly, Knave was resourceful, if frugal, when it came to her family, making, quote, four sock Eskimo dolls for their Christmas presents that year for a whopping dollar and 40 cents, a detail she shared with pride while also packing 31 boxes and sending off 20 money orders to Southern families at Christmas time. When a box was complete, Nave would sit it at the front door and enlist unwitting visitors to her home to take a box and send it to the South on their way out. Nave would provide the name and the address of the family in need. The visitor would provide the postage. During the holiday months, to help with shipping boxes, Nave sent out 150 Christmas appeal newsletters asking community members to swing by her house and pick up a, quote, box of cheer to a family down south. And the months after the fair, friends and family and neighbors and friends of friends and strangers wrote to Nave to inquire how they too could, quote, adopt a southern family and build relationships of their own. Improvisational and makeshift from the start, Virginia Nave's person-to-person -person box project gained momentum and took shape in the second half of 1964. The snowballing network of families based off contacts provided from Claire Collins Harvey, from folks coming home to uh, coming to her home and picking up boxes and sending them south. This marked the initial matching of families, of northern white families with southern black families. Nave kept families organized through a rudimentary, rudimentary index card system that's pictured here. Um, each card was comprised of a head of household and the names of all the family members along with their sizes and clothes sizes and shoe sizes and addresses, as well as the corresponding information of the northern family that provided assistance. In rare instances, an image or two of a few family members was stapled to that index card or taped to the index card. 
And during the first few years, this is how um, the box project ran. Um, this card was updated with a mix of typed information and handwritten notes and staple pieces of paper. Illustrative of the collage-like way and patchwork style that this project came together. The project expanded and streamlined communication became necessary. With mimeograph help from Myrtle Lane and Lane's youngest son who cranked the mimeograph machine for 10 cents an hour, uh, they circulated a family-to-family -family package project newsletter, later simplified to the Box Project newsletter. And a few times a year to donors, they provided updates, instructions on sending packages, and in addition to suggesting items for families, and providing compelling excerpts from families in the South, Virginia prudently asked um, helpers to ensure their packages and provide no indication that these boxes that were coming from New Hampshire and Vermont and Massachusetts were gifts to dissuade Southern racists, in her words, from damaging or withholding items from black families in need. By word of mouth and power of Virginia's typewriter, the project grew, eventually making its way to the Midwest and the West Coast. By July of 1965, there were more than 150 Northern families in 18 states and Canada contributing to the project in the form of money, clothing, scholarships, and other types of donations. Ever using her network, Ever using her network, Nave's pacifist artists and intellectual friends helped get the word out about the project. However, Nave was not limited to these familiar circles of influence, especially as the group of supporters and donors expanded beyond uh, the Northeast. Work about the project spread from one woman to the next. Though agnostic, Nave had no qualms about using the Christian community or local churches to make change, choosing instead to, quote, work with in any institution that is willing to help people. This she saw as a useful way of advancing the goal of civil rights by meeting people's survival needs. Nave's methods of utilizing mundane services like the postal system, rather than asking women or trying to corral women to go physically to the state of Mississippi, made her project also an acceptable way for women and mothers in the Northeast to engage in civil rights. So too did engaging in the domestic sphere of collecting and exchanging food and clothing. And so though Nave uh, was this global, if rural citizen, she provided, she and used the private sphere, um, deemed as an appropriate space for female labor, especially mothers, to build a project and offer critical support for civil rights for more than a decade. Thank you.